Hi, Martin Turner here. This week we review our term and ask the question, what was the most important thing I learned this term? We also review the exam advice and discuss some tips and ideas for exam preparation. When reviewing this term, we look again at the great video, How Firms Account for GST. It is critical we are very familiar with how we account for GST as it will come up time and time again in our studies and also at work. Let's start by asking what was the most important thing I learned this term. Well welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to do, this is our last week and um, the, uh, we're going to be doing revision and exam preparation. But this is our last week and for, in term and for some people it's also the, not just the end of one term subject, but the end of the year. If you've done, if you did Act 11059 in Term 1, as we have a few people here who did it, and others, this is a whole year. This is like a one-year accounting subject that we run through. And uh, so it's a great chance to reflect on what we have learned and not learned um, while we've been here, because it can get a bit hectic. I noticed that it gets a bit hectic for people around week six to eight, and then continue. all these assessments, you're trying to do everything, often at the last minute. Some people are more organised, but, um, but it's a chance to reflect. And, um, and that's also the case for me. The, um, you know, I worked 25 years in the financial markets, uh, investment banking, Private uh, funds management and private equity. I loved it, had a great time. But teaching, where I, I did a bit of teaching when I was doing, I taught at University of South Wales. I lectured in first year accounting while I was doing my year. Got a little taste and then I've been teaching for quite a while. Um, getting on to 15 years actually, 13, 14 years. And, but, and also taught music. I did a lot of teaching music when I was young. And for me, the best thing I, I do is teaching. That's the thing. That's what I like, and and um, that's what I'll see as the most significant thing I have done. And there's quite a lot of people like that. For example, Warren Buffett, we, he pops up a bit, particularly when we do our financial statement analysis subject. He's, he's a very wealthy person, made a lot of money, and stuck at the investing for a long time. And you ask him, what's the most significant thing he does? It's teaching. He has students come to him. They come to him, you know and it teaches them teaching. So I, I love it, have a great time. So you can think, reflect on, so I take a bit of time reflecting the end of each term, but you can reflect on your learning, whether you had a great learning experience, whether you had a dreadful learning experience or something in between, all sorts of things impact on our capacity to do things. <laughs> it's called life, you know. And uh, you can just reflect on what you got and didn't get and, and just reflect on your reasons for studying and what you're trying to get out of it and adjusting where you're trying to go. Some people I have, have been making changes about their direction, career direction. Quite a few people do that. Um, they tend to, uh, and so people will start in doing accounting, for example, and then decide they'd like to do something else, or they start doing something else and decide they'd like to focus a bit more on accounting. And uh, it tends to be about 10%, the up, net 10% decide to go to accounting rather than from somewhere else. So we get people from all sorts of degrees coming into accounting. So these are quite important decisions that people have been having. So the first year at uni can be a really um, critical, important year for quite a few people. And also others have been adjusting to living in Australia <laughs> and Dayanara to living in Rockhampton. And, uh, and there's a huge adjustments. And, also, other people like Kelly have been adjusting to studying after having lived and done all sorts of things and worked for years. Other people are adjusting, are juggling a lot of commitments, you know, with family and work and so forth, and all sorts of surprises. So this is the opportunity for us to reflect, and we'll also be doing exam preparation and talking about the exam advice. So first of all, we'll review. I know the exam is looming, but let's just put that to one side. Mm -hmm. the, um, the most important thing, in 10 years' time, the most let, let me tell you, in a few years' time, the most important thing is what you've learned and, and how you've built and, and where your things are going. Obviously, the marks are also important, so we'll be looking at that too. So we'll do a revision and exam advice. 
First up, what was the most important thing you learned this term? This term, not today, but this term. Just the most important thing, just quickly. Just What was the most important thing? You might say, this term has been a complete waste of time, I've learned nothing. And that's also good insight. Or you say, the most important thing, just one thing. The most important thing. Well, someone's got their mic on, I think. Do we have some people who have zoomed in? Has anyone zoomed in today? Also, has anyone else got their mic open? We should, that, it'll, it'll stuff up the video for people if there's this background noise. There's some background noise there. I can see Sydney, you might have your mic on perhaps. I can see there are two people in Sydney now. Oh no, it's David in the back. Yeah. <laughs> I see. He's going to check. It may not be. It may not be, David, but it might be. Well, we need to get rid of that microphone. Can everyone just check um, in Cairns, in Brisbane, in Bundaberg? You just check with your mics on. And um, has anybody zoomed in? I haven't got Zoom open, but if you've zoomed in, uh, Yvette, have you? Oh, not Yvette. Is it Yvette who's zoomed in? Who's zoomed in? <coughs> we do need to sort out the mic. <laughs> Still on. That oh, microphone is, is still on. We do need to turn the mic off. Um, who, who normally zooms in? I don't know who. Yeah. No it was me last week, but I don't know who else. Uh, has anyone zoomed in? I can't check from zooming. We are able to force the mics to go off on Zoom, but I haven't. I can't open it because we'll get the roundabout. Oh, look, it's gone. That's great. Thanks for that. I'll cut out, I'll have to cut out that little bit from the video if I manage it. All right, let's have a look. What have people said? I need to review and improve my note taking. Keep it simple and don't stress double entry accounting and liabilities. So some of these are, are study methods and just how we learn. There's a whole heap of skills. Be really good at learning because you'll need to do it for the rest of your life. And it's even more so now, the pace of change is so extraordinary, and we're only in the early days of it. My brother, who's older than me, so he, uh, he was over here for three weeks recently, um, uh, and visiting my mum in Yapoon, and uh, comes over every year or so, and um, he's in the IT industry in London. The pace of change is so extraordinary. And, uh, and he's had to adapt and change all through his working life. Still is, you know. And so he's not a young man anymore. But, you know, that's how the IT industry is like a good foretaste of how all industries will be. So if you're thinking about how you can learn and things like note-taking, keeping it simple and don't stress. That's right. Staying cool is so good, particularly in emergencies. That's a great exam technique is to stay cool. Don't stress it. It sounds easier than said and done. If you say, oh, I shouldn't stress, all you do is get more stressed, don't you? Mm -hmm. So how do you do this? How do you stay cool and focused? And part of it is to have a very clear idea about what you're on about <laughs> and be focused on it. Double entry accounting and liabilities. We'll be looking at those two topics today. MYOB was one of the most important things I learned in the terms. A number of people say that. You had some, you had some experience of being exposed to one of the software packages for small to medium-sized businesses. Other people say, I've been working with MIB all my life and I know it all this is so easy. So, but for many people, it just gives you a sense of, of the cloud-based software um, and just give a little introduction to that as we're laying some foundations. Overall, I've learned a lot of important things. Too many to list, but love the course. So they've had a good time. Quite a few people had a good time. You see, learning should be fun. It is fun. Learning is so much fun. And um, 
you learn a lot, and a lot of people have learnt that they learn a lot through giving feedback to other people and answering other people's questions. That's a key way to learn. So that means the teaching staff, we get to learn more than anybody else. We are constantly learning because we get to, to teach and think about things. Cash flow statements, direct versus indirect for operating activities. Great idea. I don't know, does Maria written this one down? Maria loves cash flow <laughs> statements. And uh, we'll be looking at exam preparation. Uh, one of the things you can do is look at, at some of the recent exam papers. Don't go back too far because, um, you know, we've only been running the unit this way for a couple of years. If you go back too far, you get into quite different sort of questions. But what, the questions could be quite different in different years, but at least it doesn't hurt to go back and look. And uh, Maria just loves, you'll see in the past exam, but Maria loves cash flow statement questions. Direct versus indirect for operating activities, that's right. So with um, cash flow statements, we looked at how it, we break it up into operating, financing and investing activities. And for operating activities, we have a choice. We can use direct or indirect. And uh, the accounting standards, interestingly, say you've got a choice, but we strongly recommend you use direct, mm. <laughs> unless you really have to use indirect. So that's a funny sort of accounting step, isn't it? But they, they sort of, they leave it open to use either, but they strongly recommend direct. So you'll find most of our companies use direct. And other companies like Ryman's, I'll put in a footnote, the indirect method. So you can look at your companies to see how it is and, um, uh, and, and understand how that works. That's quite central to understanding how cash flow statements work. Cash flow statements tell us what's happening with the cash. That's why Maria likes it so much. None of the accruals in there. The important, and quite a lot of people in the financial markets like cash flow statements too. The importance of memorising the three things we need to memorise. That is so good. Who, who said that? Dayanara said that. All right, Dayanara, what are the three things to me? Oh, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. <laughs> We'll get to that. <laughs> That's great. So you can see how the, 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 what was the most important thing you learned today was all different for everybody. So everybody's taking out their own things. Why is that? Why is it different for everyone? Well, the reason it's different for everyone is everyone's got a different background. Everyone's got a different set of experiences. And so you'll, you respond to the things differently. So That's good. There's some of the things, the most important things we learned today, this term. What questions still remain unanswered? No one's answered that yet. What questions do you still have? Man, this is a pretty good opportunity. What do you reckon? What would you... You can ask one question. You can only ask one question. No double-barrel questions. Just one question. If you could ask just one question, what would you like the answer to? From anything this term. Anything in life in general, if you like. The uh, What was... What questions still remain unanswered? You might say no questions. If you've got a burning question, this is your chance to ask it. All right, no questions. Let's do, we're going to do some revision, then we'll do the exam preparation. What have we learnt this term? That's what we've been talking about so far. Just reflecting. This is, you should do this for all your subjects. Just reflect on what you learned. I used to do this at uni. And then you get to the end of the degree and you reflect, I reflected on what I learned. I remember when I got to the end of my Bachelor of Accounting degree, I then did an honours year. When, but at the end of the three years of Bachelor of Accounting, I asked, what have I learnt in my Bachelor of Accounting degree? And I thought, oh, I've, I've learned two things. I've learned that an increase in an asset is a debit. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's basically those three things of memorising the fundamental accounting equation. Then I can do all the book. So I learned that. And the second thing was, as long as you don't spend more than you earn in the medium term, you're okay. 
There's quite a little bit in that in terms of how accounting measures profit and value add. But that was all. I thought, man, I, could, I spent three years learning those two things. It wasn't so efficient, was it? Maybe I could have um, learned a bit more effectively in that accounting degree. I then did an honours year, which was great. That's where I really got into understanding accounting, basically. Did you actively learn? Did you actively learn this term in this? You can think of all your subjects. But, or did I just get into this? Did I fall into this passive learning, which can be so easy to do, isn't it? And you can, I'll just get the assessments, you know, I'll just do them. I'll tell the lecturer what they want to know. I'll tell Martin what he wants to know, you know, and I'll just say that. Or do I, am I really actively learning? And uh, so that's one of the questions to ask yourself. There'll be a range of responses to this amongst different people. Um, this was, I also reviewed people's assignments a bit at the end of term. This was one student who's doing the um, uh, capstone unit. This is the unit you do at the end of your CAN degree. He's doing this at this term. I just, I, and because we sort of build up the assignments and um, some students, we encourage it, particularly in the capstone unit, just to sort of add the assignment up. Then I can just print it all off at the end and have a bit of a look through the whole assignment. So this student, this was what they said at the beginning of term. It's been over two years since I had Martin as a lecturer and I've nearly forgotten over that time how powerful the way he writes his study guides are. The preface in chapter one are no different. That's in this subject third year subject, in that the way he writes forces me to engage with the content and not just sit there and mindlessly rote learn the content of the subject. You know that sort of feeling? Mm -hmm. And he, so this student was saying the study guide forced him to do that, forced him to engage, rather than take the easy way out. As I began to read the preface, I remembered one of the key learning concepts Martin taught me back in 2017 in first year, in this case, when you studied accounting learning on the communication, you can't be a passive learner. You need to be an active learner and get involved with the teaching so that your knowledge is not shallow and instead has a depth of significant understanding. This is what a student was saying at the end of their degree, at the beginning of their last term. We should start to think back to his first year when he was learning these sorts of things. So there's some of the things for you to think about. That's the active versus passive learning. That's something you can reflect on as you go. And uh, there's nothing wrong with rote learning. That's all part of learning, right? The problem with rote learning is if that's all you do. <laughs> that's the problem. You don't make that extra effort to understand it and be active. So you've got to do. It's not a question of either or. It's a question of both and. You know. You've got to know the stuff. You've got to know what the fundamental accounting equation is. You've got to know your debits and credits, if you know it. You've got to know how we account for property, plant and equipment. You'll learn that in intermediate financial accounting. We've introduced some of these topics. You've got to know how we, how we put together cash flow statements. or how, You've got to know well, how we, it's millions of stuff you've got to know. But that's not enough. You've got to understand it. If you understand it, you'll remember it. It'll all make sense. And it has to be important to you. If, if you think it's just stupid, irrelevant game stuff, not important, well, you'll never really make the effort to learn it. But in those areas where you're interested and where you think it's important, you tend to do the active learning. Week one, we have a little tour through the term. Week one, we went through revision of the fundamental accounting equation. That was revision. Boy, was that needed, I remember. <laughs> and reminded ourselves of the conceptual framework and its importance in the underlying accounting standards. So we sort of looked at the conceptual framework. You'll have plenty of time uh, with David Keane, actually, in Intermediate Financial Accounting to get right into the accounting standards. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll be able to delve into that. And we also learned about learning. Again, again, we went over that at the beginning. We've just done it again. But there's a lot to learn about learning. To become a good learner is actually not that easy. It's not like it just... It's hard. It's hard to become a good learner. The reason you know it's hard to become a good learner is because most people are lousy learners particularly when they're in the formal learning environments. It's, people have got in, you know, just, you get busy with things and you cut corners and, and you get stuck into something that's a groove that ends up not being that satisfying further down the track. Go down the, go down the good road, you'll be happy at the end. <laughs> the, um, learn the stuff and get good grades, or well, reasonably good grades. People want, when you start working, people want people who can do the job. It's not so much do detailed technical things, but have the right attitude, good work ethic, be good at communicating, 
be good at working with people, be good at solving problems, thinking for themselves, have some confidence. They're things you can develop at work, obviously, too, but you need to have some practice in those things. So, what is the extended fundamental accounting equation? Just quickly write that down. You've got 30 seconds. <laughs> Dayanara, that was the most important thing she learned, so she'll be able to do it so quickly. You can just put Dayanara with your answer. We'll know it's you. <laughs> oh, here we go. Who's got it in yet? The fundament, extended fundamental accounting equation. There are, well, they're putting it in. Some people have got a short, for, have got a, have got, We've got two. I'm going to. I'm hiding them because otherwise it won't see it. Now we've got ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Look. Assets plus expenses equals liabilities plus revenue plus equity. As, and then we've got A plus E equals E. And I know what you mean. E is expenses. And E is equity. Sometimes I, I never know how to handle that, but I either put a little X next to E or a little Q next Q. to E. Yeah. Yeah. A plus E equals E plus R plus L. <laughs> Assets plus expenses equals revenue plus liabilities plus equity. See how everyone's doing it in a slightly different order? But they've got them on the right side, the equal side, which is the key thing. It doesn't matter what order they're in. Assets equals liability plus equity. Ah, I put in the extended fund in the question. I was, I was ready for you. See, that's not the extended one. The, that's the three items that are permanent in the accounts. Assets, equity, and liabilities. And we generally call them liabilities rather than liability. Liabilities <laughs> is the... They, they're permanent accounts. They last... They, keep, they don't... But the revenue and expenses, which is what we also put into the extended fundamental account equation, they're the... They're the accounts that we close off every year. Remember when we looked at closing off accounts? Karen took us through all that. Closing off the accounts, we empty out all the revenue expenses to nothing at the end of the year, and then we put them into, into a, a, a P&L account and we put it through to retained earnings, you know, equity for a company, and, um, and then we start again. So, ah, that's not the extended one. Ah, we need to put in the expenses and the revenue. Assets plus expenses equals liabilities plus revenue plus equity. Very good. Assets plus expenses equals liabilities plus equity plus revenue. There you go. If you can remember that, and if you can also remember that an increase in assets of debit, you have got bookkeeping. So now. Oh. Did I ask the question twice? Learning. Retention greatly increases when what we learn is connected to our experience and interests. This is a very important thing to, to have figured out with learning, particularly when you're learning in a rarefied environment of a university. If you don't connect things to reality, and that's to your own prior experience and to your interests, you won't retain them. It, it'll be sort of, it'll be academic. You know the term academic is used disparagingly to refer to things that are irrelevant, not important, not connected to the real world. So if that is your experience of that type of academic, academic can mean something quite different to that, but academic can be very insightful into what's really happening. But if, if your experience is disconnected to your experiences and reality, then you won't remember. Um, you will do pretend learning. So you will go to our exam and you will write all this brilliant stuff about whatever is in the exam, We'll be talking about the exam in a minute. And it'll all be great. And I'll be, I'm marking all the exams, actually. So I'll think, oh, this person is just, they seem to know everything about this. I don't really think that because I know what's going on. But they might be just regurgitating the stuff they've memorised the night before. And then as you walk out the exam, it all just goes away. Mm -hmm. And if you get to the end of your, your degree, like this student I quoted from, um, from the, um, who's finishing their degree this year in the capstone unit, if you get to the end of your degree, you'll go and graduate, you'll get your degree, everyone will be great, university, everything. And if you haven't learnt much, to the extent you haven't taken full advantage of what you've got to learn, if you've got real gaps in what you don't have, you don't know a whole heap of stuff about certain things, who's lost? Has the university lost? No. Mm. Have I lost? Is there, no, I haven't lost. No one's lost. Yeah. Other students lost? No. The only person that's lost is you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, you know, I'm not trying to... 
we, we, can, we can only operate within our constraints, but to the extent that you take full advantage of your opportunities, learn what you can and get it grounded, that'll stand you in good stead and you'll be happy. The, um, I'm actually going to New Zealand for a wedding soon. Maria's going off to New Zealand. I'm going off to New Zealand. <laughs> Just going to wedding. I'm popping through Wellington. The wedding's down in South Island. I'm popping through Wellington. I thought, oh, I'll catch up with one or two past students there. So I just didn't mind them. Catch up with them. And because uh, it's great to talk to students, I might have talked 10 years about something. And uh, they are, um, and some of them are doing really well with their careers. They tend to be the ones that I've kept up with. They're all doing really well. They're powering along because they've got the goods. They learnt the stuff. They've got the foundation and they're building on it, you know. And not many people do that, so you'll stand out. So that's something to think about. The connecting, so we've, you've got some practice with that with the KCQs, you know, with the steps. Everything we learn, you start from what you know, which is your previous knowledge, private, previous experience. You start with what you know and you go to the unknown. That's how you learn. You don't just start from nothing. We all start from what we know. And what we know may be incorrect, or it might be only half right. Or it might be quite good for what it is, but then we build on it. And learning is not just about impersonal information transfer. See, uh, I, I'm all for passive learning and, inform and information transfer if it works. If you could get the study guide or a textbook and put it under the pillow at night and, you know, you go to sleep, wake up, and it's all just come through, that would be perfect. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that approach, you can try it, but the only problem with that approach is it doesn't work. <laughs> that is the only problem. It doesn't work. And I'm telling you, the impersonal information transfer approach doesn't work. There's a few people I know who have really good memories. You know, they've got that sort of, they can just memorize stuff, and they do it. <laughs> Man, how do you remember that? They just pick it all up. So there's a few like that, and they can, they can retain it, even though they don't understand it very much. They can retain it, but they still don't understand it. They can't really use it effectively. But the, the rest of the people just forget it. So don't do that. It, it's important to get the information transfer. It's important to deal with it. You've got to be able to come up with a fundamental accounting equation at the end of first year. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to know that because that's just so fundamental. You've got to build on all this stuff. But it's more. It's about understanding it. You see, the fundamental accounting equation is not just some meaningless equation. It's the business model that accounting is based on. Accounting could look at a whole lot of stuff if it wanted to, but it doesn't. It just looks at those five elements. That's all it looks at. That's it. There's a whole heap of other stuff. It doesn't look at it. It's doing this stuff. Accounting may well change. It's, it's, there's a lot of movement towards including more. And the fundamental accounting equation just includes what affects the firm, that's the assets and liabilities, and the owners, that's the equity. And revenue and expenses are temporary accounts, they're temporary changes to equity. It doesn't look at the impacts on employees, it doesn't look at the impact on the environment or on the general community, it doesn't look at the impact on its customers or its suppliers, a whole heap of stuff. A successful company, a highly successful company like Roman Healthcare, will have a lot of, you know, in the long term, a long term successful company like that, that's really adding value to the equity investors, such as my children, those people, they'll also generally add a lot of value to a lot of other stakeholders, to staff. And so, Roman Healthcare pays 20% above the award. And uh, they, uh, and, and in New Zealand, they increased the award quite a lot just uh, this year. So Ryman's immediately increased, made sure they kept the 20% margin. They pay them 20% more. They also look after, they give them a lot of opportunities to train, to get these extra qualifications, which helps them earn more and progress, which is all great for the employees. It's also great for the company because there's a huge shortage of staff in the aged care, which is growing like you wouldn't believe. Ryman Elke is growing, it needs more. So it decided quite a while ago to position itself like that to get the best. And so goodness only knows what the competitors are doing, but they're going to have to match it, aren't they, mm. at some point in New Zealand. But they'll be slow, and then they may match the salary, but will they match the opportunities for progression and stuff like that? So Roman Healthcare doesn't do a perfect job on all of that, but it, you can see the staff, there's, there's a lot of um, benefits to staff in these things and customers and so forth.
So anyway, I won't go on about that too anymore. So we did, that's what we looked at in week one, the learning and we reviewed the fundamental account equation and so forth. In weeks two to four, we had the wonderful Karen McPherson from Sunny Cairns. Not, the weather up there is not quite as perfect as your Poon and down here, but it's pretty good. We covered the dual entry bookkeeping process in some detail. We looked at all that. Even though it's automated, even though there aren't people with <laughs> quills and books anymore, they're not there. It's, it, the data entry is, is largely automated. It's like when we go to the Coles checkout, we're going to see the video on that in a minute. Those people at the Coles, those checkout people are data entry clerks. That's their primary job. They also smile at you and, and put stuff in bags. You know. That's, but they're primarily getting the accounting entry right. You have, so it's all automated. You know, we don't post things to journals and stuff like that. But we need to understand how all that works. And you'll never find yourself doing it, so you better learn it now. Because underlying, because accounting developed as a manual thing, hundreds and hundreds, thousand years ago probably, but certainly a long time ago, it was, it was all documented in 1492, 1494, whenever that book was produced from Luca Pacioli. I won't ask what the name of the book was, but um, Luca Pacioli, um, but it, prior to that, those ideas have been around a long time, were developed in a certain context. But we've kept those ideas. We still have the same ideas. And so we need to understand that if we're going to understand accounting so we can use the numbers to connect to the businesses and give advice. You have to demonstrate your understanding of these week's contexts in your assignments through steps four and five. We'll also see that it's part of the exam advice. You'll see that we're also examining some of this stuff. Well, let's have a look at this video. This is, this is a really great video on how we account for GST. This is something we need to know because GST pops up. It's going to pop up all the time in your studies, but also in, throughout your life, basically. Let's look at this. Are you struggling to understand how firms account for GST? This video will give you some tips to help you when accounting for GST comes up. GST comes up in a lot of different transactions for a firm, so we need to understand the basics of how to account for GST right at the beginning of our study of accounting. The first tip is that typically all items in a firm's income statement are exclusive of GST. This means that when Coles sells you a chicken for $8, it will only include $7.27 as revenue. The rest, 73 cents, is the GST Coles has collected from you for the government. This amount is kept in a separate account, GST collected. Revenue accounts are usually shown exclusive of GST because the GST a firm collects from its customers is not its own revenue. Rather, it is money the firm collects for the government. The same also applies to a firm's expenses. Coles may have bought that chicken for $6.50. It would only include $5.91 as an expense in its accounts. The rest, 59 cents, is the GST Coles has paid to its suppliers and which it can claim back from the government. This amount is kept in a GST paid account. By keeping the GST collected in its own account separate to its revenue, a firm can carefully identify GST and manage it separately to the firm's revenue. The same applies to its expenses. The same also typically applies to all items in a firm's balance sheet. These are usually stated exclusive of GST. A key exception to this is accounts receivable and accounts payable. These items in the balance sheet are usually shown inclusive of GST. This means that unlike most items in the balance sheet, accounts receivable and accounts payable do include GST. 
This is because our customers owe us the GST inclusive amount, not just the part that is our revenue. And we owe our suppliers the GST inclusive amount, not just that part that is our expense. When we chase up our accounts receivable, customers who owe us money, we need to collect from them the full GST inclusive amount. And our suppliers expect us to pay them the full GST inclusive amount as well. Firms often handle GST in three separate accounts, GST collected, GST paid and GST payments refunds. As there are no standard terms in accounting, these accounts can have a range of different names in practice. You will have lots of opportunities in our unit and throughout your degree to practice how we account for GST. You will see GST comes up a lot in accounting. Further key details about how we account for GST are in Chapter 4, Section 4.1 and Chapter 2, Section 2.2 .2 in the, our study guide. To find out more about how GST works in Australia, go to the link in the description below this video. I just threw that in, it's a bit of revision. You can see how, you can assess how on top of GST am I? This is just, a, you can think about this for everything we've studied. There's no subtle exam tips or anything like this. I'm just pulling that out because this is an important area to know. It's not, it's not necessarily something that gets examined, if you like. But, um, so you can reflect on whether you know this. The, uh, a cash flow statement, we looked at income statement balance sheets. Cash flow statements are those items inclusive or exclusive of GST. Usually. Who would like to tell me? <laughs> oh, cash flow statements. We saw balance sheet income statements. They're usually exclusive of GST. We saw the exception of accounts payable, accounts receivable in the balance sheet. But other than that, they typically um, exclude GST. We keep it on separate accounts. What about the cash flow statement? When you're looking at the items in a cash flow statement, are they inclusive or exclusive of GST? Who would like to tell me? Just one at a time. Don't rush me. <laughs> it's a 50-50 if you want to have a guess. I'll say inclusive. <laughs> We've got one inclusive. The uh, Kelly said inclusive, and that's right. Cash flow statements are usually inclusive of GST because the cash includes the GST. Now, Ryman Healthcare, for example, its, its, its cash flow statement, they've decided to make it exclusive of GST. They make that little note. So they've gone against that. There's some flexibility around that. But um, these are the things you need to know. You see, if you find yourself not knowing stuff, been scratching around, then that's not good. You know? <laughs> but you know, it's, it, um, I'm just throwing that in as one thing. You do need to know those things. You will, you will find GST pops up all the time. And I think someone, his mic is open again. And you're typing as well. So are you at home? Uh, so that's, that's what we did in the first few weeks. I've just sort of got a little flavour of it. Um, we then in week five, we covered one of the most common current assets, or inventories. Ryman Healthcare doesn't have inventories, for, for example. So about 25% of listed companies don't have inventories. But a lot of companies do. And for companies like West Farmers and so forth, they can be a very big item. So you need to understand how we account for inventories. So we've done a bit of work on that. And that you're able to demonstrate your understanding of that in the assignment. But just because you did that, you might have forgotten it. You know? And there's this great video on Cole's supermarket here which I'm not going to show, actually. I feel like we should keep moving along. This is, this is one of my favourite ones. It's, it's not necessarily a favourite from viewership, but I think this is great. This is, you see, if you can link the concepts to things in the real world, then you grab a hold of it. You see, you need to review and revise the stuff we've learned. Well, if you go to the supermarket, which most of us do a fair bit, while you're standing there and they're checking it in or you're checking it in yourself, you can reflect on how... That is a data entry operation. That's primarily what those the checkout operators, their primary job is data entry for the accounting system. They also smile at you and say, how are you? And they pack your bags and take your money. So that's what they do. 
But the accounting is so important. That's how the stuff, how we get the stuff into the accounting system. And so this video goes through what the accounting entries are that are going on. It's all invisible, isn't it? But this is going on behind the scenes in the computer. And it's, and it's accounting for inventory. We know that Coles uses a perpetual system. And I think they use, I think from memory, they use the av average, actually. I think they might use weighted average. Either weighted average or FIFO, I can't remember. They're the two common ones. But I think they might, I think they use weighted average. So you can, you can find that all out in the video. But if you've got that in your head, then you can revise it every time you go to the supermarket. Man, you'll know how we account for inventory if you do that. Most people won't. They'll, they'll turn up with David and other people next year and they've forgotten everything. <laughs> but there it is. That's a great video. I really like that one, but we're not going to show. Week six, after the midterm break, we then got a bit more practical. We looked at MYOB, which for one person um, in the beginning of the class, they said that was the most important thing they learned. So for some people, this is very is, 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 um, is great to get into the, they haven't had exposure to software patterns and stuff, so we're just giving a little bit of introduction to software. We understand that some people have had exposures, but you can also learn a lot just getting, just having a bit of a look through fresh. And so we did that, and, and we had the opportunity to actually use it, and in step eight of the assignment, demonstrate your understanding of it and use of it through step nine. So you've had a little bit of introduction. There are obviously other packages that do small to medium-sized businesses. And then, of course, um, different packages do um, larger companies. But even with the larger larger products that in big companies, Excel comes in a lot because often the reporting isn't that good. And so a lot of it's done through Excel. So it's, And so you've been got a little bit of experience more with Excel through this year. And uh, we find that 90%, probably 95% of people's Excel skills are not good when they start, <laughs> like not, either non-existent or very limited. Um, and so we get a few people who are really good. There's one high school actually in the Gladstone area, I know the teacher there, who teaches them really well Excel. So we, we, we get a you know, student from there each year and they're great. <laughs> but most people haven't had that experience. You need Excel. You cannot get too much of Excel. So. The software, so you just, and there's heaps of experience and you'll get opportunities to use that in other years. Um, so that was week six. As we move through memory lane, week seven, it all might be a blur to you now. We focused on receivables. And who lectured receivables? Who'd like to tell me who took the class on receivables? Just one at a time, don't rush. Who was the lecturer? Maria. Was it Maria in Mackay? Maybe it was Karen in Cairns? Karen? Was it Karen in Cairns? Oh, Maria McCoy? Yeah. Any other ideas? Was it Martin in Rockhampton? Yeah. Who gave it? Everybody's name. Who gave it? And John did liabilities, I thought. Oh, John, did he do liabilities? He didn't do it? Receiver. Uh, who did the receivables class? Who'd like to tell me who did receivables? <laughs> Dana, I was going to check. Yeah. <laughs> who would like to tell me? Who was a lecturer during receivables? How about in Mackay? Who have we got in Mackay? Is it Adam? Who did, um, Adam, who, who took the receivables lecture? So that was week seven. Week seven. Oh, what about in Sydney? Are you able to tell us? Who took the, who was a lecturer on receivables? John Bundaberg. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they've looked it up, Dan. I looked it up. John, John, I'll ask you, who was the lecturer in, of, of receivables this week, this year? It wasn't me, Martin, because I did uh, 9 and 11, which is um, 9 is liabilities and 11 is equity. That's right. You didn't do receivables, did you? So who did receivables? I didn't think you did. Um, let me have a look. John remembers what he taught. Who did receivables? That's me. That's his voice. <laughs> You're in the video, John. <laughs> I must have done. Yeah, sorry. You did do receivables, John. Even John has forgotten he did receivables. Nobody in the class. <laughs> and look, you've got a response. Struggling to understand receivables. 
dear. Oh, we've got the video on here. You know, they've turned it up. Yeah, there you go. So John can't even remember doing it. Let alone, can you remember? Nobody seemed to remember the lecture. So receivables is a very important area. That's a common... We, we've seen that receivables is so common. Again, top companies like Ryman's have very little receivables. They, they get the money in advance. You know, they don't muck around. But, but typically, receivables, you're doing a lot on credit and, uh, and also you're owing a lot of people's stuff. Ryman's owes people's stuff. <coughs> so receivables um, is an important area at how we account it. I shudder to ask people, how do we account for receivables? Because I don't even remember. How do we value them? What what do we value them at? What's the what's the rule? Who would like to tell me how we value receivables? Week seven, we're week twelve, it's only five weeks ago. <laughs> it's not five years. How do we account for receivables? What do we put them in at? You see, I think um, the uh, Kelly's trying to look it up. Hmm. We do do we do it at cost? Net. We do it at net? Minus the value, this is what it says. <laughs> well, I had my tonsils out, so I wasn't there. Kelly, what are you going to read about? Okay. Uh, this is the version I've got. Yeah. On a company's balance sheet, accounts receivable is typically, typically reported as accounts receivable, comma, net. That means accounts receivable minus the value of the allowance for doubtful or uncollectible accounts. That doesn't answer it. You see, is it a cost or is it at net realisable value? You know, I think it might be at net realisable value. But anyway, we'll move on. Week eight, we focused on non-current assets in general in week eight. That can be quite a big area for many firms. And in particular, we looked at a, at a very common, almost every company will have property, plant and equipment as a key non-current asset. And you'll get to study that with David next year on how we account for it. So we've done a bit of an introduction on that. And uh, so you're able to show your understanding of related depreciation concepts through step 10 of your assignment. There's a common misconception that depreciation is sort of you're reducing it because its market value goes down or something like that. That's not what depreciation is, is it? What is depreciation? Who would like to tell me? We've got a couple of keen people here in Rockhampton, but, but they keep wanting to look up their notes. Who cares what the notes say? Anybody can look up notes. Parrots, you know parrots, they can learn 200 words or so, and you can have a conversation with a parrot, and they can say, hello, how are you? Yes, they can go through it all. The parrots don't understand anything. They don't know what they're saying. They know nothing. Don't be a parrot. Be a human being. All right. Understand it. So depreciation is what? <laughs> So it's a concept. It's a process. It's a process. Of getting a, an asset to an expense. That's right. There's a nice little one-minute video on that, isn't there? Mm. That's essentially what it is. It's turning an asset into an expense mm. in such a way to match it against the revenue it's earning. Mm. So as we're using up that, an asset is a future economic benefit. We, we've got a bit of a definition of assets floating around, haven't we? But the idea of there being a future economic benefit we can have as an asset as we use up its, its capacity to give us future economic benefits, we can depreciate it. Do we typically depreciate land? That's part of property plan no. agreement. No, why not? It doesn't depreciate, but it amortises the value. What do you mean? Yeah, but that doesn't answer the question. It why don't we depreciate? It increases in value. There's land no. often increases in value, that's true. Yeah. But remember, depreciation is not about its value. It's not it's about its future economic benefit. Land generally doesn't, it's, it just keeps getting future economic benefits and affected. It still keeps going. And in fact, we're going to look at fair value next year, and David will take us through that, take you through an intermediate. There's a whole lot more. This is called introductory financial accounting. There's intermediate and advanced, and it gets turbocharged when we start to move. And so you'll look at fair value, very common concept that we came up. So if some, if, and, and, we, um, and you'll see how we can revalue things to fair value could be up or down. But in terms of depreciation, land tends to, to retain its future economic benefits. Just We don't use it up. You know, it's no. still a piece of land, still a piece of land. Week nine, liabilities. Oh, who taught liabilities this John. week? John. <laughs> John, yes, John we know, liability. John said. And John even remembered we taught liabilities, which was excellent, wasn't it? It was, mate. Big, big pardon, John? 
Yes, it was me, Martin. I know. You... <laughs> uh, you're going to get so ribbed by your two students on that. That's so good. Week nine was all about liabilities. Amongst other things, you learned how GST is accounted for as a liability. When contingent, li- you know, contingent liabilities, we looked at provisions, um, and that's we will be examining liabilities a bit. We'll look at that in a minute. And uh, week ten, Maria's favourite week, cash flow statements. There's a bit about all of that, and that was also one or two people's key things, particularly the difference and, and knowing about direct and indirect for operating activities and cash flow statements. That's an area we have a choice. The accounting standards strongly encourage you to use direct, so use direct if you're doing it, unless you've got a good reason not to. And tip, quite often firms show both, one, in, one indirect by way of footnote. Then we did equity. Who taught equity? Who taught equity? John. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> I taught equity. I remember that. It was only last week. Yeah. Equity. And that is a very complex area, and you'll be studying quite a lot more about how we account for equity in future. One of the things we, we looked at, it was only last week, we looked at is equity is different to the other elements of accounting in that the typically the other elements of accounting, what are those other four elements of accounting? Assets. Yeah. Expenses. Yeah. Revenue. Yeah. Liabilities. Yeah, those four, they tend to be accounted the same way regardless of the business structure, typically, generally. But equity is is accounted for quite differently depending on the structure, whether it's a company, a sole trader, a trust, or whatever. And um, and we we focused on it, companies. So we we looked at how we account for equity for companies, and we saw that there were two or maybe three main types of elements of equity. You know, parts of equity. What were they? Capital issued. Issued capital. Yeah. And. Uh, retained earnings? Reserves. Oh, issued reserves. capital reserves. And retained earnings is a form of reserves, but it's sort of a special one, so we can think there are three as well. Uh, okay. So if you look at the video and also the lecture, it's about, is it two or three? It's, I use that just to stimulate the thinking. This is foundational stuff. You see, we just looked at the main types, issued capital rev, uh, reserves and retained earnings. We're going to build on all this stuff. So if you don't know all these basic things, and we only looked at it last week, you're going to be floundering around as you move on. And we also discussed other comprehensive income and where it belongs in the financials. We also looked at declaring and paying dividends in Australia. Equities included in the exam. And week 12, we're here. Phew, we've covered a lot this term. That's a Maria statement, that one. (laughs) So that's a little bit of a trip down memory lane. It's a very good idea at the end of term to take a little bit of time out and reflect on what you've learned in all your subjects. What have I learned and what haven't I learned? What was I interested in? What wasn't I interested in? It's all right not to be interested in stuff. It's all right to be interested in stuff. And a key thing at the end of a business degree or accounting degree, first term, am I interested in business? (laughs) Am I interested in business? If you're interested in business, all the different disciplines are so interesting, aren't they? If I'm interested in business, I want to know what's going on in business. Accounting is an important part. Pick if you want to get into senior management, man, you better know something about accounting. Or if you want to be an accountant. Or if you want to do a whole heap of stuff. Or even be good at marketing. You need to know a bit about accounting. So have a little reflection and reflect on what you've learned or not. So that, this has been a little bit of an opportunity just to stimulate that thinking. And uh, will this just be a big black hole that you have no memory of? A bit like the receivables lecture. The, uh, <laughs> how are you remembering... What do you remember? Receiver is an important area. What do we remember about it? Or equity. So, exam preparation. Um, who's sat an exam before at university? Uh, Everybody. You got exams? In oh, I had a steps exam. Steps exam. Quite a few people may not have done an exam before at university who are coming here. So, we'll, we'll just... Um, it's, it's, you, you'll have a few exams. And so, people in accounting, actually. You have a few exams... So you need to get some techniques around it. Make sure you come early to the exam. Um, There's perusal time before the start of the exam, so you get, I think it's 15 minutes. So make sure you're there in plenty of time. Also, you don't want to be rushing in. Also, allow it's a bit like catching an aeroplane, really. Give yourself a bit of a a break, in case something happens on the way in there, because you don't want to be flustered. 
it's a better to get there plenty of time even if you're just around the corner having a cup of coffee um, uh, and be there in plenty of time for it to start so you can spend your time reading when you're reading you, you can't write you can just read but you can have a look at the questions and the key thing to do in the reading is stay calm because you'll see people will be frantically reading through it as if their life depends on it but, you know just have a read of the questions but and some of the questions you will find easier than others They'll, some it will be different for different people, you know. But you'll say, oh, that's an easy, I think I've got a pretty good idea on that, but this one I'm really not clear on. So you, you, you can sort of do that. And then as soon as you can start to write, don't start answering the questions. This is my advice. I mean, you have your own techniques, but this is just some suggestion. Write down on your scrap piece of paper some bullet points about your answers to the questions, to some of the questions. So key, just key bullet points. The sort of things that you might have memorised or night before as well but it's different things write them down for those questions and then for the questions you're finding really hard you may not have much but have a really good but have a but that's all right too and then i would suggest you start writing the ask the easy questions first that may not be the first question for you it might be question four you don't have to do them in the order just make sure you put very clearly on the exam paper what the question is i'll be marking the exam so you'll be talking to me the um so question, you might be question four first. If that's the easiest, knock over the easy questions first. And you may still have some parts of the question you're not too sure of, but just answer the question. And, and then when you've done that, go to the hard ones and then um, and do them. And what I used to find when I did exams, I was so good at exams as a student. In my day, that's all we had. We just had exams. We used to just have one exam at the end of term. And then they would give us a midterm exam too, which we weren't too happy about, and we'd do that. And then they brought in continuous assessment after a while, which wasn't so good when you liked exams. But we, that's all we had. So you had to be good at exams. I was really good at exams. I had this exam technique down pat. But of course, when I started work, I never did any more exams. So it wasn't such a useful skill. But it was good at uni. And you're at uni, you've got to know how to do exams. Bring your student card and relevant writing materials and calculator. Make sure it has enough battery power. It's always someone whose battery seems to run out. You may, you may bring an unmarked water bottle into the exam. Now, there's exam advice. That's posted up on Moodle. You should read that in conjunction with the information provided in the unit profile on Moodle. Now, this, the same exam advice is for the standard exam, which is the one you're sitting, or the deferred one for the People who might be sick on the day or whatever. So it's all the same exam advice. There's no separate exam advice for the deferred. That's if you're sick on the day. It's best to do the exam on the day if you possibly can, but if you are really crook, you can defer. The exam is a closed book three hour exam. You'll have a 15 minute perusal time, which is in addition to the three hour time limit. Non electronic translation only dictionaries are allowed but you cannot take an accounting or business dictionary into the exam. You'll be provided with one sheet of rough paper and one exam answer booklet. If you require more exam answer booklets, you can ask your exam supervisor on the day for additional booklets. So just right away, if you find you need another booklet, you just ask for one, they'll give you one. You can also ask your exam supervisor for extra rough paper on the day. So you get one page, but if you, if you need more, you can ask them for that. You're required to answer all questions in the exam on the exam booklets. So you answer everything on the exam booklets and not on the exam paper itself. You answer on the exam booklets. That's what I'll be marking. That's what will come to me and I'll mark your exam paper. The examination comprises four questions worth different marks each, adding to a total of 50 marks. The exam's worth 50% of your assessment. You are required to answer all questions in the exam booklet provided. Have I repeated that? Each question may contain subparts, so it might be 4A, 4B, and this sort of stuff. Read each question carefully. Just take your time. There's no rush. Just read it carefully. Just read it carefully. Because just let's say that you've really got the question right. Don't answer it. Then you're not going to answer some other question that you think it's saying. Just read it carefully. There are no tricks or anything, but just read it carefully. Write neatly, if you can. I know writing is a bit of an issue. It is for me now. But just write as neatly as you can. Just make it easy for me. I'll be sitting at your poon, marking the exam papers, you know, having coffee at home. And um, just 
Take it easy for you. Don't make it too hard for me. If I can't read it, it's not good. But just sort of write reasonably neatly. You will require a calculator. Bring a calculator. This must be a non-programmable, non-text reasonable sum calculator. Journal entry num narrations explanations may be required, but this will be specified if relevant in the exam question. And there's some exam advice there. You can read the relevant study guide chapter. Probably already done that. But you can watch the video lecture for the week. There's also great little videos. Yeah. And this is just for your revision generally, but for your exam preparation, that can be good. And workshop questions. But the key thing is there'll be no content in the exam that's not covered in the unit material on Moodle. It's all there. It's obviously, we're only examining a tiny bit of it, but, you know, it's all there. And we've got some commonly asked questions that we do get asked, so which we can discuss. Um, oh, yeah, and, we, and we're going to do that now, actually. But, and then we're going to... We're going to That was very quick, and uh, the exam advice I've got up here. So this is the exam advice, and this this is the this is the cover sheet of the exam. That's what you'll see when you, you come in, and then this is the structure of the exam. These are the topics. Now you see that there's no receivables there, John. You see no receivables. Week five, we thought people won't remember it, you know. They, <laughs> so we didn't. We do different topics, different years, you know. So you can see that we're doing, we've got a question on the introduction, double entry bookkeeping. That's 12 marks. Then we've got liabilities and equity, those two weeks. So that's weeks one to four. This is weeks nine and 11, liabilities and equity, 11 marks. And then we've got inventories, week five, 15 marks. And statement of cash flows, 12 marks. That's Maria's favorite topic. So we had to put it in, didn't we? Statement of cash flows. And that's week 10. There'll be a mixture, a mixture of practical and theory questions in the exam. And you can see that here, you see the chapters, we give you the chapters of study guide, the tutorial weeks, the weekly questions, and the lectures. And so there's various videos on lectures, but also on topics. And so that's, this is the material that, that the exam questions are drawing from. So, you can ask me any question you like now. What questions would you... Here's some commonly asked ones. But what questions would you like to ask me? Is that water bottle all right? Yeah. yeah. Long, you can bring a water bottle in as long as it's not marked. I'm sure not this one. Like, you don't write stuff. A cheating exam, you know, but the... It's, well, everything's well-researched, you know, it's academia. So people have researched. And a cheating exam is about 10% worldwide. But don't, it's all sorts of ways you can cheat. But 90% of people don't cheat. Don't cheat. You know, just go and do it. Put your effort into learning the stuff. Is my I don't cheat. Also, it's very, very bad to cheat in an exam that's related to business. Because business is all about trust. See, the global financial crisis occurred because the banks stopped trusting each other. They didn't know the quality of their balance sheets anymore. So they didn't lend to each other. The whole financial system came to a grinding halt. It's, destroy it's destroyed a lot of people's businesses. It's cost us all billions of dollars. We've all been affected by it. Trust. Trust in business is so... You're, if you've ever been running a business, you know that. There's a huge amount of trust. So if people start getting dishonest in business, and there are, is a certain amount of dishonesty in business, but there are some people who are really straight, and those people can, are, are typically very, are much more likely to be successful long run. Not saying some of the crooks don't get by too, but the the um, and so don't cheat the business examples. The building number is eighty one. Is that the big sports? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, it's, you're you're responsible for finding out where your exam is. There's obviously millions of locations and the time. It's all on the thing. All right. What questions would you like to ask? We've got some time now for questions. Just one at a time. Some commonly asked ones there, if you, 
if you've got any of those. But you don't have to ask me any questions, but what questions would you like to ask? Well, how long should we spend on each question? How long should we spend on each question? This is my idea on this. Uh, again, I was very good at exams, and this is what I used to do. I used to say, look, there's 50 marks in this case and 180 minutes. Mm. I would actually... Uh, you've got 15-minute reading time before in addition, but I would also, I'd also allow quite a bit of time at the beginning to just write draft answers, just bullet points, just downloading all my thoughts for all the questions on the scrap piece of paper. Mm -hmm. I would spend 15 minutes doing that. You may only need five or ten. But I would just spend time... I'd spend 15 minutes, say, something like that. And so say you had 180 minutes, say you spent... How does the maths work? The um, it's, uh, 15 minutes isn't going to work out so well, is it? But it, it, say you had five minutes for reading time, you get 175 minutes, then 50... That still doesn't work too well. But anyway, however the maths is going to work, I would do about 15 minutes to draw up my answers in terms of planning. And then you've got... Um, a hundred and uh, and then then you've got and then you could have a little bit of spare time at the end, and so then you might get um, say you allow fifteen minutes at the end to sort of Review. mop up. Yeah. But the the uh, and so then you've got um, two and a half hours. So it's 120, 150 minutes. Yeah, there you go. You've got one hundred and fifty minutes. So fifteen minutes. I would prepare my answers. Fifteen minutes spare at the end. One hundred fifty. Three minutes a question. So we know how much we you know. How many, you know the structure of the exam. So three minutes, I allow 36 minutes for question one, 33, uh, that's uh, 45. So I, I, I'd have all that planned before going to the exam, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and so, and I'd stick to it. You've got, to, you've, got to have a, you've got to have a clock up on the wall. Usually there's a clock up on the wall, isn't it? But if, in the old days we used to have watches, you know, but I'm not quite sure how you do this now. But usually there's a clock on the wall and you, 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 I just, and if you run it, used up my time, move on to the next question. Because you, you can always come back. You've got the 15 minutes at the end. You can always come back to the questions, but, you know, answer all the questions. Don't not answer any of the questions. Yeah. You see, um, has anybody read the American um, Declaration of Independence? Has anybody read that? No. No, you haven't. The Declaration of Independence, it starts out saying that all, all people, or something like that, all men are born equal. This is a country that had slavery, by the way, but anyway. Uh, all men are born equal. Well, let me tell you, all marks are not equal. Some marks are a lot easier than others. That's how, the, that's how everything's structured. There's some easy marks floating around, but then there's some hard ones because that's what distinguishes the HDs and the Ds and the credits are the more harder questions. So answer the easy... You know, get, if you, make sure you answer all the questions because even if you... You might get half marks for something that's relatively easy... You may not be able to get full marks for it if you don't know it so well. But getting half marks isn't that hard, or getting 40% for a question isn't that hard. So just I make sure I answer everything. Even if I'm not too sure about something, put something in there. Yeah. You never know. You might get something for it. But hopefully, if you've studied well, you'll, you'll know. And you've got the topics. Yeah, so I, so th so I, I, I would suggest something like 15 minutes you might have for extra reading time. And that, that's not reading time, it's sort of planning your answers, bullet points. And then when you're writing the questions, you just refer to the bullet points to trigger your memory of the ideas. If you've, if you've done some mnemonics to remember stuff, you know, uh, or you might write the fundamental accounting equation down, or it might be whatever it is in the other topics, you can sort of do all that. You've already read the questions beforehand, so you sort of know the key things, and then write the questions. Three, three minutes of question, and then you've got 50 minutes at the end. And then you just go through your questions, read them through again to try and... The, quest, the exams get three hours, but it's generous. The timing is usually generous, so you'll have... You should, you, if you did that sort of plan, you probably found you'd have at least 15 minutes at the end to review. I always used to work the full time. Maybe if you're happy you've answered all the questions, you're full out, you can leave. But... I'd usually work the full time and just try and squeeze out any last marks I could. What other questions would you like to ask? Did that answer the question? Yes, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Plan your time in advance. You can do it now. Yeah. You can just figure it out. I just did a little plan there. You can, you can have a different plan, but whatever the plan is, plan your time and stick to it. It's just like being in a long distance race. You know, you have a plan and you stick to it. Don't worry about what other people are doing in the room. Who cares? 
Just yeah. stick to your plan. You know, most people they'll open up this. <laughs> most people in the exam, this is my experience. You turn up, they would rip open. It was sort of like <laughs> they'd open it up, like their life depended on it, and then they'd write like blazes. That seemed to be what the strategy was. And I thought, what? And I would always be because you didn't get reading time in my day, so I'd be reading it as well. I wasn't writing anything, and I was just writing a few bullet points. You try that technique, everyone around you will be writing like the winds, and you're doing this, and they sort of look at you almost like you're crazy. But I wasn't crazy. It was a good strategy. What questions would you like to ask? So you yes. suggest to use the three hours, the full three hours? Yeah, if you, if you, if unless you just completely emptied it out. Yeah, There's yeah. no point just sitting there doing nothing. No. But but you know, I would read. I, you just go through the questions again, and mm. just and then you say, yeah, I'm pretty comfortable with that, or I've got that reasonably well, but I just seriously do not know that bit, and mm. I just don't know it. There's no way that's going to come to me. Mm. Yeah. With you. Yeah. What other questions would you like to ask? We've got about five minutes, so you can ask whatever you like. Another trick on revision weeks is to have done a bit of preparation for the exam in advance. I used to do this because there's a skill to asking questions mm. at this point, but you can't do it if you haven't sort of done a bit of exam preparation. So I used to do a bit before the revision question and ask questions. There's a skill to asking questions because it's basically a game of trying to figure out what the questions are in the exam. Because you're, that's basically your exam preparation. You're trying to practice, you're trying to guess what's in the exam a bit and, and prepare for it. And we give you a little bit of guidance. So you've got the topics, but within that. Mm. And if, if you get skillful at asking questions, you can't just say, oh, what's in the exam? What question have you asked on equity? But there are ways of asking if you've done a bit of preparation. You say, look, you know, I've been looking at this and what do you, and you can sort of get a bit more sense of where things are. Can we refer to the past exams? Can you refer to the past exams? Yeah, a good exam technique is to go back into the past exams, but only go back a certain way with this subject because we redesigned, it, we resigned it as Act 11081 in 2017. So that's, and it gives you a fair bit anyway, doesn't it? So I think it was term, um, Particularly term two, 2017, is when we redesigned it quite a lot. And we've made quite a few changes in the last year. So don't go back too far. But yeah, past exam papers, Maria and I have been running the subject. It goes over three terms. And so um, that could be a good idea. It's best not to go, if, if the people, if check who the unit coordinator is. This is for other subjects too, if you're going for past exams. I would only ever study exam past exam papers of the same unit coordinator. In this subject, it's Maria or I, we sort of talk together. Mm -hmm. So, if... Where are the exam, past exam papers? Where are the exam, past exam papers? So you can figure out, you need to figure out how to find them. They're very easy to find. We're doing a little bit of crosswork here, but if you don't know how to do that, talk to your... Talk to others in the unit. Everybody will be able to help you. Yeah. And we do lodge the exam papers, but yeah. we don't put in the in the questions, in the solutions, I should say. Oh, okay. Thank you. There you go. You pick something up. I did. Thank you. And they can oh, be yeah. like practice okay. questions. You can practice them or, or get a sense of the type of questions Very that may be asked. <laughs> what other questions would you like to ask? Excellent. There you go. You pick something up then. I did. Thank you. Uh, the weekly questions, can we go over them again to prepare for the exam? Yeah, that's one of the things. You can go over weekly questions. They're part of the uh, tutorial questions. There's weekly qu There's various material each week. I put it up in the exam up here. So, so we've got, say, for weeks one to four, it's worth 12 marks. So if you do three marks, three minutes a mark, that's, you've got 36 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's the study guide. Most people have read the study guide because you've done the KCQ. Some people read it better than others. But um, the tutorial, weeks two to four. So we're, we're quite specific on the different things. So that's the sort of area. Okay. Thank you. And you'll see some of the topics we've asked questions before in previous exams. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes not. You know, we pick different topics. It's sort of like we focused on a few topics each time. Um, 
to in the exam. Also, quite a lot of material is done in, in this set in the assignments as well. Did that answer that question? It did. Thank you. What other questions would you like to ask the rocky people? I'm getting a great round here. <laughs> You can ask whatever you like, and um, the answers are all on video, so they're available to everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm at with Lois in Brisbane. Hello, Lois. And look, you've got people in Brisbane, I can see. We do, we do. And we've got a few questions just about question one. So um, it says there'll be a mixture of practical and theory questions in the exam. But it looks like when you look at the weekly questions and the tutorial questions for those, that week, for the, you know, the weeks that we covered for question one, a lot of that is quite theory-based. But we did the practical for the assignment, so um, in Myob and um, in assignment, during the assignment time. Would that be an indicator that there will be some questions that might be more heavily theory-based and others that will be more practical, heavily practical-weighted? Gosh, Lois, you're doing the heavy lifting for the students, aren't you? <laughs> the question. Well, I'm looking at it thinking it makes sense to me. Jeez, Lois asked. knows the game. She knows the game. That's right. So certainly some, question, some of these questions could be more heavily practical and some could be more heavily theory. That's right. So... Um, and it's a, quite a while since Thank I said the, it's quite a while since I said the exam, so I'm not quite sure, you know what, but I, but yeah, yeah. So you could, yeah. So you've got to make some judgments about where you think that it's more theoretical and more practical. But um, I do try to put a bit of theory in all the questions. I, I can't really remember the exam, so I'm just <laughs> saying my general thinking is like I really like to do that, but I may not have, you know, um, for all the questions, but. So, but there's a mixture of theory and practical across the exam paper, paper but you're quite right with certain topics. Did that answer the question, Lois? Yes, that was a good answer. Thank you. See, Lois knows nothing about the exam. It's just I wrote it and Maria reviewed it, actually, so we're the only two who know anything about it. And we did it so long ago. You have to do it so early on in term that I just forget. I can't remember what's in it. <laughs> it's a bit like John forgetting about the receivable structure. <laughs> I can't remember the exam. I can't remember what's in it. But um, I haven't looked since. So All right, what other questions would you like? We've still got, a, we've got two minutes. What's that? If not... Um, oh, okay. So there's some common ones there, but we've come to the end of term. Now, we've, we're having a lot of nice chats here on the microphone here. here. Sorry. That's all right. You, you, it, it, on all the other locations, they're great. They're talking. They're doing stuff. But when I've got the mic over there. Oh, sorry. The, uh, we've got... Um, so it, I, it's, it's been great having everyone in the unit. That includes everyone online. And, and I've interacted... I've been interacting with everyone, really, in all sorts of ways. And um, sometimes it's... A lot of it's asynchronous. A lot of it is... Um, you know, through the reflective learning journals, I've, I've really connected in with a lot. I read everything. I don't give a lot of individual feedback because there's, you know, some kind of millions of students. You can't, I really like to, but, you know, um, but we generally, I put a few comments up on Facebook and stuff. So, but it's fantastic to see what people are doing. I've even quoted a student from another subject on one of the slides in their PCQs, you know. So I do read them all. And so I've got it, I've connected with, where you're coming from in many ways. It's been great to have you. I trust that you've been laying some foundations this year. I've been, been a, a slightly tough in some ways with our revision, but the, um, and, uh, uh, and particularly developing some capacities that you're going to find useful in the real world. And by using real companies, that can help you get a bit of a sense of what's happening in, in practice. Um, and encourage you to revise, prepare for the exam now. Don't just leave it the last minute. Um, you do the cramming just before the exam. You can do it the night before. You know, that's when you're putting into your short-term memory stuff. They're often acronyms or bullet points. And, you know, just that small amount of stuff that you're cramming in. You have to do that the night before. But the other revision, do that now. Otherwise, you'll come up against the exam before you know it. If you just think, ah, oh, it's not for a while. Um, and use the exam advice. 
Also, I'd encourage you to take a photo, do a selfie now, take a photo, put it up on our Facebook page. We've done it in Rocky, you can see ours. Um, and say goodbye to everyone who's on the other locations. It's been great having everyone this term. I look forward to seeing you all again, um, and uh, which will be great, and many of our teaching staff. I'd also like to thank all our teaching staff, Karen in Cairns, um, David in Sydney, Lois in Brisbane, John in Bundaberg, who I hope is still talking to me after our receivables jokes, um, Mohammed in Melbourne, and Maria in Mackay, who is heading off to New Zealand at the moment. It's great working with everyone. We have a great teaching team here, and, and I think everybody's found that with interacting. And it's also been a really great group of students, and uh, I've really enjoyed 